Good afternoon. We've been laser focused on stopping the spread of COVID-19 and trying to get things back to normal. And while fighting COVID-19 has been top of mind for our government, other important initiatives have not been forgotten. Our government is prepared for other risks and challenges facing our province. We are ready. We've been ready since the start of flooding season. As the weather gets warmer, flooding is top of mind for many and it's top of mind for us because we've all witnessed the devastation that flooding brings with it. It destroys everything from schools and homes to roads and bridges. Last year, at least 10 regions in Ontario declared a state of emergency due to flooding. I toured many of these regions personally. I saw firsthand what Mother Nature can do. It can change your life in a matter of seconds because when it comes to your home, when it comes to your community, there's no greater threat. And with everything happening this year, it's more critical than ever that we're ready for this season. And it's up to us to protect our own. That's why our government has been hard at work preparing for this year's flood season. In March, we delivered our flooding strategy to protect people and property across the province during the spring flooding season. We have a war room in Peterborough, our flooding command center, where we have teams monitoring water levels and water flows 24 seven in every waterway across the province. Surveillance flights have already begun in the far north where we monitor the ice breaks as they're happening. This is the kind of real time information that can save lives. But despite our best efforts, we can't stop the flooding. But what we can do is be prepared. So when we know water levels are rising, we're ready to deploy our highly trained emergency personnel, men and women like our heroic forest fighters who transition to emergency flood management, including efforts like sandbagging. These teams are on standby and ready to be de deployed where they are needed. And I want to reassure the people of Ontario, if you and your family are imminent danger from flooding, we'll be ready. We're on standby to bring you to safety. We're ready to help people evacuate. We're working with our federal partners to ensure every option is on the table, including emergency assistance from the Red Cross and military personnel. And while we pray that it won't come to that, we must be prepared, and we are. We will be ready to act. We'll be ready to protect our own. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Now I hand it over to Minister Yakabuski. Thank you, Premier Ford. Last year, the Premier and I toured parts of the province that were devastated by severe flooding. It was heartbreaking to see the damage to homes and communities. It was a situation we vowed to be better prepared for in the future. That's why on March the 9th, ahead of this year's flood season, we released a comprehensive flood mitigation strategy that outlined specific steps to help the people of Ontario better prepare for flooding events. But this year, we needed to prepare for more than just rising water. Due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we had to ensure the proper measures were in place to protect the health and safety of emergency workers and communities. And we have done just that. Since the beginning of the flooding season, we have closely monitored ongoing risks across, across the province. Right now, there is an overall low risk of flooding throughout southern Ontario, with no reports of significant flooding as the spring thaw draws to a close. Among the Great Lakes, water levels are very high and are expected to remain so for the next few months. As a result, we are working with communities to put plans in place in order to keep residents safe in the event that shorelines are overtopped. In northeastern Ontario, there has been some minor flooding this week after the rain event of a couple of days ago. We're monitoring the situation closely and ready to respond 
to any requests for assistance. In the far north, current projections show a moderate to high risk of flooding for the James and Hudson Bay coasts. On Thursday, my ministry launched surveillance flights to assess conditions in this area. We will continue to closely monitor the flooding situation in the far north as the spring ice breakup occurs. We will also continue collaborating with partner organizations and other levels of government to advance the important long-term initiatives contained in our flood mitigation plan. We know there's nothing we can do to prevent flooding. We can only become better prepared for it. And that is exactly what we've been doing because protecting the people of Ontario is our top priority. Thank you. And I'll now turn it over to, to Solicitor General Sylvia Jones. Thank you, Minister Yakabuski. We are all aware that this year's flooding season is not business as usual for anyone at, due to the added challenge of COVID-19. Nevertheless, Ontario is ready to respond to anything Mother Nature throws at us in the coming days and weeks. As Minister Yakabuski explained, Ontario has been closely monitoring and is prepared for any challenge during this spring flooding season. Each year, we gain more experience and expertise and gather more data to help emergency partners better prepare communities for the threat of rising water. While the COVID-19 outbreak adds a level of complexity to our efforts this year, I want to assure communities that we are ready and we will be there for you when support is needed. We are ready because of the work that has been undertaken throughout the year in close collaboration with our federal partners, municipalities, First Nations chiefs and councils, and agencies such as the Canadian Red Cross. One specific consideration related to COVID-19 is that First Nations leaders have expressed a strong preference to stay in their land for as long as it is safe to do so. We respect those wishes and will remain in close contact with First Nations leaders to ensure that we are ready to respond if the community means escalate. I want to thank the emergency personnel and partners for their diligence and professionalism. Because of their year-round efforts, we stand ready to provide support and resources to communities that find themselves in harm's way. Thank you. With the phone line for questions, just a reminder, one question, one follow-up, please. First question. First question comes from Salman Farouki from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, Hi. Premier Ford, I wanted to ask, um, you had some strong words for lockdown protesters last week. Um, but what's your reaction to see that they're back outside Queen's Park today? Um, you've already said that they've endangered people around them by uh, their gatherings. So uh, what would happen if this happens uh, week after week? Well, you know something, I, I said what I, I said last uh last week and uh it's it's i i first of all i i understand people are, are hurting out there and people want to get back to work and there's a lot of people hurting and i can i can appreciate it but what they're what they're doing is putting their lives in, in jeopardy as far as i'm concerned with uh congregating uh you know side by side and and i so i get it and i'm, I'm not against any any protests we we live in a free society uh, we believe in freedom the right to protest, but what what just burns me up uh, more than anything, more than them standing out there, is I look out the window and and I see our Canadian flag being flown upside down, and when I when I see our flag, our Canadian flag being flown upside down, that's the utmost disrespect to the men and women uh, that are overseas fighting for our freedoms, our Canadian military, the the six families, the lost loved ones. In the, in the crash last, last week. The, the 250 men and women that are uh, in harm's way walking in to the, to the long-term care homes and, and uh, saving people's lives. And they, you know, they have the nerve to fly our Canadian flag upside down and disrespect the men and women of our Canadian Armed Forces and disrespect uh, the people of Canada that we've all been united through this this you know challenge, and uh, that that's what really really burns me up. If they want to fly our, our flag upside down, they don't respect our country. I'll be the first to help them pack their bags, and they can get find a country uh, that they want. But don't be flying our Canadian flag 
upside down. That means everything to the people of Canada and our, our men and women on, on uh, the front lines. Follow up? And, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, and I also wanted to ask a question uh, related to how Quebec's premier has talked about ta tackling the pandemic. He's described it now as uh, two separate sort of fights, um, one in the province's long-term care homes and one in the rest of the province. Yeah. Is that also how you see the situation in Ontario? And how does that sort of affect um, how you approach opening up in the future? Well, I, I agree with uh, Premier Legault. Uh, there's two different worlds right now. We're, we're fighting this virus, uh, one in long-term care homes and one in the public domain. In the public domain, everyone has uh, done an incredible job. Everyone across our, our great province has been following the protocol from the chief medical officer, and that's the reason we, we see the, the trend uh, going down, and uh, we just want it to continue going down. We need consistency for a couple of weeks, and uh, then we can loosen things up a, a little bit. We had a, a little glimmer of hope yesterday, and we'll continue uh, giving people hope in this province to try to make sure we get back to the, the new normal as quickly as possible. And uh, we're, we're working together. Everyone's working. And I just want to thank the people of Ontario for everything they're doing. Next question. Next question comes from Kari Birma from CBC National News. Please go ahead. Thank you very much and good afternoon, Premier and Ministers. Premier, you said this week we all need just a little bit more patience as we're approaching reopening. We're starting to see cases slowly starting to drop. Based on what Dr. Williams and the command table is telling you, can you paint a bit of a picture about what summer will look like for the average Ontarian and what's at stake if we don't get reopening right? Well, first of all, thanks for the question. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, a gradual downward slope in the, in the public uh, domain and uh, the, the lower we get, the, the more we can open up and get back to, as I say, the, the new normal and get people back working, getting uh, people out and about, and, and that, that's really what it comes down to. I wish, I wish I had a magical clock, I could tell you exactly the, the time, but to be very frank, I, I don't know the exact time, or I'd be, uh, I'd be very transparent with the people. But as we're uh, working together and as I get information, I pass that information uh, onto, onto the people of Ontario. But if we keep going the way we're going, we're going to get out of this a uh, lot sooner. Uh, than, than we uh, thought we might be able to get out a couple months ago. But I, again, I appreciate everyone's cooperation. Follow up. And just to the point that the Canadian press reporter made, we're seeing also protests in Ottawa uh, about individuals who are saying shut down the lockdown. Is there a concern that if the phased approach takes too long, that we're going to start to see more and more people just ignoring the recommendations from the command table. And again, what is the risk if that starts to happen? Well, you know, I, I don't believe that's going to happen. Uh, as long as people keep uh, going uh, by the protocol that the chief medical officer has put out there, uh, we're going to get through this. Uh, we've come such a long way. We've all stuck together as a team. And this isn't the time to separate the team. We just have to keep moving forward and uh, we'll get out of this uh, hopefully sooner than later. And we're doing everything we can as a province uh, to make sure that happens. Next question. Next question comes from Erica Natevdad from City News. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. My question is for Minister Elliott. It's just in regards to vaccinations. Uh, School-based clinics are of course not available right now and that's how many parents are able to keep up to date with their kids' vaccines. And for younger kids, parents are just understandably concerned about bringing their kids to clinics to get their shots. So how concerned are you about a drop in vaccination rates and uh, what, if any, measures are you taking to address that? Well, it is something that continues to be very important. As we've seen, we don't have a COVID-19 vaccine yet. Hopefully we will very soon, but that's why we were uh, last fall speaking to people about getting the flu vaccine. That's something that is really important. And what we're taking a look at in the healthcare system uh, is 
first of all, the number of cases that we're dealing with, the number of people that are being admitted to hospital with COVID-19, as we look at balancing that with getting things back to reopening elective surgeries, getting people the cardiac and cancer surgeries that they need, getting children vaccinated, of course, that's also very important. So we're really, it's, it's a very careful uh, balancing that we need to uh, maintain to make sure that we will still have that capability in our hospitals should we need to admit more people with COVID-19, but also wanting to get to those essential surgeries that people have been waiting for. I know that's causing a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. We are working on that plan right now, but also having children vaccinated. I think that's going to be even more important to the people of Ontario as they've seen what's happened with COVID-19 and how they can keep themselves safe, at least from the flu. Hopefully soon there will be the vaccine for COVID-19 too. And just as a follow-up, are you working with health units at the moment to maybe set up a safe way for kids to be vaccinated? Or are you actually just tracking unvaccinated children? We are looking at that on a daily basis. Yes, we are working with our public health units on all of those issues because public health units, of course, have the responsibility, primary responsibility right now for helping with COVID-19, but they have many other responsibilities as well. And the vaccination of children is absolutely one of them. Next question. Next question comes from James Murray from Net News Ledger. Please go ahead. Uh, Premier Ford, thank you for taking my call. Thank you. Uh, a liter of fuel is about 70 cents in Toronto. It's about the same price in Winnipeg. In Thunder Bay today, it's 96 cents a liter. In Dryden, it's 94 cents a liter. Gas prices jumped by about 10 cents a liter in Thunder Bay this week. Transportation for Northerners is already hard enough because inner city buses have stopped running starting today. What can be done for Northern Ontario residents with these kind of gas price increases? Well, we have our Minister of Energy, Greg Rickford, uh, all over this. It's totally unfair that, uh, you know, you're, you're paying 90 some odd cents in, in Thunder Bay and, and Kenora and other places. But in, in you know, urban areas, you're, you're paying 70 cents. You know, are the gas companies just trying to gouge people? They, well, we're going to get an explanation uh, off the gas companies for this because it's unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. People are, are paying, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent more uh, in Thunder Bay and, and Kenora and other regions. Uh, but we'll, we'll get down to the bottom of this. I promise you, we're, we're already all over this. And uh, there's no better uh, person than uh, Minister Rickford uh, on the energy file. But he's uh, he's on it. I promise you. Follow up. Yes. Uh, follow up across Ontario for Indigenous people. Sacred fires are an important part of cer ceremony of grieving and of healing. Yeah. Yet under the fire ban, we're being told that Indigenous people can't hold a sacred fire for their spiritual purposes. Can Ontario amend the fire ban for this purpose? Well, I'm gonna uh, put you over to the minister that's in charge of that. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me for that question. Uh, as you know, on April 3rd, we instituted the restricted fire zones and the ban across, uh, across those zones across the province. However, uh, First Nations or Indigenous uh, peoples, if they uh, want, uh, need to have a fire for ceremonial purposes, uh, we would urge them to reach out to their district offices and uh, they can work with them to, uh, to, per to give them a, a permit for that uh, purpose. But I would ask them to reach out to their uh, local district offices uh, on that issue and uh, they are aware that uh, our offices are aware that those requests could be coming. Next question. Next question comes from Scott Lightfoot from CTV News. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Premier. Hi, uh, wondering, as the province starts uh, easing the restrictions and allowing businesses to reopen, there are some concerns that businesses may not have enough customers, sustainable revenue to operate in what you've described as the new normal. So is Ontario planning to do anything to address the challenges for these businesses after they reopen? And do you foresee offering more financial aid should businesses continue to struggle once they've opened their doors again? Well, Scott, everything's on the, on the table. Um, what we've done is everything from lowering hydro costs to making sure that they have uh, rent subsidy uh, when they, they go back, uh, making sure that we've lowered their, their taxes by 8.75% uh, on, on small businesses. But that, that doesn't stop. I, I understand uh, these small businesses are hurting right now and they need our help and uh, we'll do everything we can. We've lowered WSIB premiums by $1.2 billion. So there's uh, anything that we can do. We're going to help kickstart the economy. We're going to help support them. 
because they're the backbone of our economy, small businesses. We have to give people confidence in Ontario uh, that the economy is going to move forward the same way it was before the, the pandemic hit us. We, we were on absolutely just booming in, in Ontario and leading North America in, in uh, economic development, job creation per capita, anywhere in North America. Uh, I'm, I'm confident. I'm confident uh, with the people and the small business owners. Uh, once we start rallying together, uh, we'll, we'll do well, well, very well. It's not going to happen overnight, and, uh, but we'll make sure we support them any way we can. Follow-up? No follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Next question comes from Morgan Campbell from Global News. Please go ahead. Thank you. This question is for the Premier. Okay. Um, you know, the protests you, you have uh, outlined that they're unacceptable. Why not send bylaw or police in just to hand out fines, Premier, um, to anybody not respecting physical distancing to kind of nip this now? You know something, it's a great question, Morgan, but I, I can't do that. There's no premier. Uh, I have my sole gen solicitor general behind me. Um, we can't direct the police. Uh, I have confidence in the police. They, they know uh, what needs to be done on any circumstance. But I'll leave that up to the, the leadership of the, the Toronto Police and bylaw officers uh, here, in, here in Toronto. Uh, do I think it's a little unfair, people... Uh, walking through a park with their little child in a, a, a stroller and they get a ticket and these people don't, well, I'll leave that up to our great police. And by the way, I want to thank our police, our bylaw officers. I think the world of them. They're doing an incredible job and I'm sure they'll do the right thing. Thank you. There's also concerns um, with, you know, restrictions in terms of fishing seasons and, and the spring bear hunt. Um, there are some people who are concerned about the, how these restrictions can impact, um, you know, such as things as the bear season. I guess there's about 20,000 bear licenses sold to Ontario residents every year. Can you tell me a little bit about um, how Ontario is going to approach the hunting and the fishing seasons that are upcoming? Sure, I'll, I'll pass this over to the minister, but you're allowed, you're still allowed to fish uh, out there, but he's the expert when it comes to the bear hunt. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And, and uh, yes, as the uh, premier has said, uh, the fishing seasons that are scheduled to open have opened uh, on schedule uh, and the, uh, the turkey hunt uh, did as well. And spring bear hunt uh, opened um, yesterday, May the 1st. Um, those seasons are opening as scheduled, and but we have made sure that people understand that regardless of what activity they're taking, that is taking place or what activity they, they are participating in, uh, that they must respect the protocols that have been laid out. <clears throat> and, and granted, in some areas, uh, there are some restrictions to access. Uh, some municipalities, municipalities have closed access points uh, within their borders. Um, so there is, there is um, realities with, re, with respect to that. But when the season went on uh, last Saturday, we were quite uh, actually impressed. We got reports from our conservation officers who were very pleased with the conduct of the public uh, with last Saturday's opening. So we expect the same thing to go on uh, as other seasons uh, do open. Uh, people are quite aware of what the expectation is um, regarding social distancing. So we want them to protect themselves and to protect others. Follow the guidelines, follow the protocols. Uh, other than that, we've, we've, we've clearly said uh, in other uh, forums that if things aren't respected, we will have to revisit some of the decisions. But as of now, uh, we're comfortable uh, that people have been respecting uh, the protocols. Thank you. Last question. Last question comes from Brian Lilly from the Toronto Sun. Please go ahead. Premier, I'd like to ask Brian. your reaction to yesterday's announcement by Prime Minister Trudeau and several cabinet ministers regarding firearms. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney has said that uh, what they've done is singled out law-abiding Canadians who purchased their property legally, have owned these items safely for years and have committed no crimes. He went on to say that money would be far better used to pursue the smugglers and drug gangs that plague our society. Yeah. Given that the feds are talking about $600 million, um, and that's the opening bid, 
to buy back these guns, to enforce all of this. What could you do with Ontario's portion of that $600 million to actually deal with the crime guns that are plaguing our society? Well, uh, good, good question, Brian. First of all, I want the people of Ontario to know that uh, our government will not tolerate, I'll tell you, they will not tolerate any gun crime of, of any, any kind, not now, not ever. And uh, all out of all people, myself, I know our Solicitor General behind me, we have zero tolerance for violent criminals. And I've made it uh, my mission as, as Premier to target the thugs and the lowlifes that are out there terrorizing innocent people. Over the past two years, uh, we've invested heavily uh, we've worked hand in hand with our law enforcement, which we support and we absolutely love our law enforcement, to tackle guns and gangs at its core. That, that's the problem. And as law enforcement experts have highlighted, highlighted uh, time and time again, the only way to truly tackle gun violence is to crack down on the illegal uh, guns being smuggled in daily at our borders. Put money at our borders, our, our great uh, uh, you know, people that serve the border security, Canadian border security, they're incredible. Give them the money and greatly uh, in, increase the, the legal uh, ramifications for these convicted gun crimes. Uh, I've said this over and over again that you know, the, these people, they, they get charged and what's frustrating to police officers uh, they're back on the streets in a few days. Or if they get sentenced, they get sentenced with a gun crime for a year or two. The problem is not the legal gun owners. Uh, we need to target the smugglers, and we need to throw the book at these gangsters out there terrorizing our streets. And the, and the federal government has set aside hundreds of millions of dollars to buy back illegally purchased guns from license, uh, legal licensed gun owners, responsible legal licensed gun owners, uh, and, and I can't help but, but think that that money could be put in, in a much better use uh, hunting down the violent criminals and, and stopping illegal guns at our borders. And I'm here and ready to, to work with our, our federal government and, our par and partner up with them and uh, to work with them to stop the guns coming in from across the border. And uh, number one priority is you know, let, let's really strengthen the, the bail conditions. Let's strengthen the, the sentences rather than uh, give them uh, these nasty criminals, these gangbangers a slap on the wrist and they laugh at our police. Let's start giving them some tough sentences. Throw the key away with these people if they get caught with guns. Don't give them a slap on the wrist and then try to point the finger at legal law-abiding gun owners and spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of hard-earned taxpayers' money uh, for not for what? You think the gun violence is gonna is gonna go down in Toronto? Well, I, I don't believe it's gonna go down in in Toronto based on taking guns off legal gun owners. Uh, what I do believe will drop the drop the crime and start throwing these guys in jails, protecting our communities, protecting our families and our kids from uh, these gangbangers. That's what's gonna stop it. Thank you. No. Th thank, okay. thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy. All the best.